there is, you know, three to four, you know, massive brands. I'm not going to mention them, you know, but because uh, we are I'm starting to work with them. Uh, and some of them, we're going to be working with them in the future as well. But there's just some of these brands, man, and some of them in Florida as well, just doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And I would the best imagine. part is that they also have the support as of the HBA from that mission statement I, I mentioned earlier as nice, well. Nice, nice. So security and safety is one of the, the top priorities that they have, you know, at a federal level as well. Okay, so Henry, good to see you. Brad, what is this, round four, round five? This is something like round four for us, I think round five overall. Awesome. So awesome. you did that one with John before me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I forgot about the, the early days. Exactly. Yeah, we, we've upgraded now. So. We have. It's a new <laughs> system, it's a new setup. We're looking forward to it. Awesome. So excited. Just give a quick little refresher about your experience in the merchant processing industry, specifically within the CBD hemp sector. Just a quick little background. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, was very, very fortunate uh, over the last three years to delve into you know the CBD and hemp industry. One of our high risk uh, sponsor banks called Fresno back in late 2021 actually opened up to CBD and hemp. And that was actually when I got started in the industry. Uh, so I got a very good taste of what the industry, what is what was at that time and how far it's come in just you know the last two years. So I'm really excited to you know talk about some of the updates that have occurred in the last you know six to seven months as the industry. Um, well to me it feels like it changes you know week to week, month to month, but you know I'm just excited to talk about what I've learned, talk about some of the new businesses I've looked at, the new mm -hmm. consumer packaged goods and um, you know, really get your thoughts at the end of, uh, you know, what you guys think about the CBD and hemp industry as well. Perfect. Um, let's drill down on a specific topic, something we talked about uh, getting into today, Delta 9 THC beverages. Yes, yes. Oh, how, my God. How do they differ from other CBD products and what unique challenges and opportunities do they present for businesses in the industry? So they differ in uh, a few ways, but I think the biggest way in which they differ is the way in which they're getting into retail stores. You know, a lot of the, the CBD and hemp products that we know from before 2023 and before 2022, they were mostly on the e-commerce front. Okay. And it would actually be directly from business to business in the way in which they would get into retail stores. Right. But now that we're talking about a beverage, you know, they're going through different channels, you know? Sure. So they actually go through the distribution to retail channels um, that big liquor and big beer companies have established, you know, over, I would say, the last century and or, uh, you know, over the last decades. And instead of, you know, uh, an e-commerce company speaking directly to a smoke shop or some type of alternative wellness store, or convenience store, uh, you know, selling directly in between each other, uh, these Delta 9, uh, uh, Delta 9 hemp beverage companies are actually going through the big liquor distribution channels, um, you know, to get into these big retail stores. But they're not getting into the smoke shops. The convenience gotcha. stores or the gas stations anymore. Right. They're actually getting into your local uh, uh, liquor store, your local bars, and the biggest ones are actually, you know, in Florida it's the Publixes of the world. In other states it might be, you know, the Total Wines. Uh, and there's actually been some other companies that have been fortunate enough to get some Kroger deals in the Midwest as well. So we're looking at a completely different demographic um, for the CBD and hemp industry that we've seen. Uh, since 2018 with some of the more uh, local products like, you know, vape, flour, tinctures, and obviously one of the most popular, which is the edible uh, products as well. So completely different game, completely different players sure. and much different amount of money uh, uh, supporting, you know, the big liquor industry than, than there was prior. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me, since I know you've, you have a lot of information on this, um, what inspired the formation of the Hemp Beverage Alliance and how has it impacted the landscape? of the Delta 9 THC beverages. I know that there was uh, 20 to 30 uh, original players that were trying to create a uh, hemp beverage company together. And, you know, they kept meeting week to week. They started doing it, you know, bi-weekly. And they're like, wait, guys, we have a great group of people that are starting a bunch of different, you know, uh, CBD and, and hemp beverage brands. Why don't we actually, you know, create something, you know, out of it? And that happened about two years ago. So the, the group has actually been together for about four years. But okay. two years ago, they actually... Uh, created the HBA in general. And I think the biggest uh, notion, you know, four years ago, they didn't have the plans to make it as official as it, it has been today. It's grown, I think, by uh, 1,500 uh, followers on LinkedIn just over the last year. You know, fortunately, I was one of those characters, you know, I haven't been involved uh, in it that long. But I think one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest reasons, you know, this demographic of really, you know, entrepreneurial, you know, thinking people and business owners just come right. together is just based on you know, how the CBD and hemp industry has been before the beverage game kind of showed up. And there wasn't a lot of 
industry, you know, compliance, you know, uh, industry requirements. There wasn't a lot of people in the industry kind of, you know, looking for protection, packaging protection, skin sure. protection. And I think the HBA was lucky enough to see that early on. And they actually wanted to take a different look at it. They wanted to get a committee um, together very, very early before the, uh, the hemp beverage industry really took off to actually look forward to compliance and uh, uh, regulation, not only at the federal level, but state by state as well. And I see a lot of players, you know, from New York coming together to help Florida and then right. Florida coming to help California. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's something very, very different from what the, the industry has been used to. And everything that I've seen and all the information I've been able to pick up on so far has really indicated that, you know, the, the D9 hemp beverage industry really wants to not make the same mistakes that the regular CBD and hemp derived industry made. And they actually want to put compliance and regulation is one of the first mission statements that they want to focus on before, you know, outspreading, you know, this product uh, throughout the rest of the U.S. Well, I'm sure the experience of the other hemp beverages over time or the other, sorry, hemp industry over time and kind of the lessons they learned from that kind of told them what they need to do from the start. Yeah, because there, there was a lot of players from, you know, the old hemp and CBD sure. industry that actually delved into the Delta 9 uh, THC industry and it's still very new. You know, I'm working with a lot of people in the HBA. A lot of them just actually got their merchant accounts approved. They still don't have a lot of their web URLs live. And I've kind of seen uh, uh, the owners within the HBA at three different levels. You know, kind of the first level, which is people just getting started out. Uh, the second level is people, you know, starting to pick up the sales, you know, starting to do tens of thousands. And then there's, you know, three to four, you know, massive brands. I'm not going to mention them, you know, but because uh, we are starting to work with them. Uh, and some of them, we're going to be working with them in the future as well. But there's just some of these brands, man, and some of them in Florida as well, just doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And I would the best imagine. part is that they also have the support as of the HBA from that mission statement I, I mentioned earlier as nice, well. Nice, nice. So security and safety is one of the, the top priorities that they have, you know, at a federal level as well. What about kind of current trends and developments on the merchant processing side of things when it comes to the the beverage the hemp beverage yeah industry. So there's actually one uh that i saw and this was before i actually joined the the hba and i was really fortunate it's one of my really big partners up in minnesota if you're watching this you know exactly who you are um but i got a coa um about a year ago uh, of this hemp beverage company in minnesota and what i noticed on the coa is that the delta 9 thc and the total thc which are like the two me metrics depending on the the sponsor bank that you're using and the company that you're using that they uh, look to measure to your cannabinoid amounts to see if you're going to get an approval or a decline. And I noticed on his COA when I first saw it before sending it to our underwriting team, which is literally right over there, <laughs> um, is that the total THC was at a 1.27%. And I would looked at myself, I looked up at the sky a little bit and I was like, how the hell am I going to get this approved, right? Sure. Yeah, so yeah. I went ahead, I called my partner and what I actually found out is depending on the state that you're in and depending on the COA that you get, not all of them are going to show up in the regular serving dose where the total THC is always going to be below 0.3. Because on the specific beverage uh, COA, uh, I noticed that it was of an overall batch amount that actually wouldn't go into one consumer package good. And oh. I was lucky enough to do the math and look at the statistics after talking to my partner. And I actually made it of the overall summary that I sent over to underwriting. And when they sure. actually looked at it, you know, they verified with the laws that luckily Minnesota's done an amazing job online. And they actually, you know, double checked my math as well. And they went through everything. <laughs> uh, they, you know, they kind of gave me the thumbs up. But then a little bit after that, I ran into another challenge as well, which had to do with the flavoring of the Delta 9 oh, wow. beverages. You know, there's seltzers, there's waters, there's sodas. And in this specific scenario, it was actually sodas. Okay. There was a bunch of different flavoring that they had, but they only had one COA. And the pain point that that individual came to me with was, Hey man, I only have one COA. I'm adding flavor to these different products, but I'm just adding flavor. I'm not adding terpenes. I'm not Ooh, actually right. extra cannabinoids that would actually uh, make the COA at a higher margin than it was originally submitted. I was like, you know, I, I, my first thing was like, let, let me calm him down. Let me get him in a good headspace and let's see if I can get the information that I need from him. Luckily, I was able to do that. And after I had all of the information with all the COAs and the different flavoring, um, you know, we're really lucky here at TouchSuite. You know, we have an underwriting team that from my desk is literally 100 steps away. Right, it's right here. So I was really lucky to just walk over there, uh, have the conversation with them. And they were like, oh, if he's just adding flavors and he's not adding any terping or additional, you know, cannabinoid profiles, then we'll be able to take that one COA for the seven different SKU types that he had and we'll be able to approve them from the merchant processing point of view. If he had decided to potentially go with the other home, it would have been anywhere between, you know, $2,000 to $3,000 to get an additional COAs for those products. 
which we know from the SMB startup uh, phase that companies can be in, that it's just not ideal to you know take three thousand out of pocket and not put it towards something like uh, enhancing revenue sure. or ad spend. Yeah, yeah. So now, what kind of strategies do you employ? You brought up obviously compliance is such a big deal in this industry as with all others, um, and it's a lot of this is so new. So what what kind of strategies do you employ to ensure the compliance? with their regulations while still being able to provide the, the payment processing services you need to? Yeah, well, I've been, especially at, the, at this company, TouchRoot, I've been very, very lucky, you know, that we have the underwriting and risk team that we have. Because to be completely honest, sometimes, you know, this, this industry moves so quick and so fast that it's, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, in my part of the, the industry or if you're even a business owner, even on the legal side, there's changes every week and every single month. But I've been so lucky to have such a great, underwriting team here at TouchRoot that stays up to date because some of the lobbying relationships we have and then some of the uh, the law firms that we have relationships with that send us updates in a week to week basis. I've been lucky to, you know, sometimes submit deals over there and sometimes mm -hmm. it's me that, you know, goes to them with a certain type of update. They're like, oh my God, Henry, thank you. Like I, you know, we had no idea. Or sure, sometimes yeah, exactly. I submit something and then they send something back and I'm like, oh, what the heck are you guys talking about? And then I'm fortunate enough to walk over there, have a quick little discussion about it. And then we have a new, you know, update you know, within the industry, but to, you know, be exact, exact on them, anything that I state today, you know, might change next week. Um, but, you know, from that point of view, you know, the real, real big thing um, that I think not only the Delta 9 industry, but, you know, the CBD and hemp industry in, in a whole is looking forward to. And, you know, some of us are scared and some of us are really, you know, have a really positive attitude is the, the 2024 September law change. I actually, that got moved by end of the uh, end of year yesterday, uh, last year in uh, February, and November as well. It's the federal farm hemp bill which again was supposed to be changed this year. It got moved over to this year. And that's kind of, you know, the thing that everyone is worried about because one little minor change of that language could potentially, you know, put this whole industry out of business. But the thing that I feel very positive about, and I'm really happy that the HBA is the thing and the Delta 9 beverage uh, uh, industry became a thing is because of the different type of lobbying and the big money that we have behind the industry now compared to before, which is the big liquor industry and those right. distribution channels. So I'm really, I don't think, and a lot of the legal players I've spoken to and a lot of the people in the industry that are in and out of Washington are in communication with the DEA. They've told me that they're anywhere between 70 and 80% sure that the, in, that the law is going to go our way. But at the end of the day, that 20 to 30% still, you know, should instill some type of fear in people, not only sure. within the industry, but it still instills fear in, in, in people like us, you know, on the merchant services end. Understood. What about uh, consumer education on that side of things? Making sure people understand where things are, where things are going. Uh, anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, so that's actually, there's, there's five miss, mission statements, and that's one of the, uh, the biggest ones. I think that's number two or number three, and that's obviously the most important thing is always consumer safety. Sure. Because at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do is create a product that is somehow going to intoxicate any even individual, especially the ones that are purchasing it of age, but something really cool about the HBA, and there's some announcements coming soon, so I'm not gonna say too much about it, but we're actually trying to plan um, a show, like uh, MJ BizCon, or the Alternative Products Expo, or the CBD Wholesale one, and at these shows specifically, they're gonna have a bunch of different seminars, um, testing products, um, safety and control uh, uh, regulations and kind of classes and practices at this committee. So it's not only going to be about exhibiting your product and how can I generate more sales, but they're actually going to have certain components of these shows where they're going to be showing the consumers and it, can't, it doesn't only have to be consumers, right? Sure. It can be any types of uh, scientists, mm -hmm. other lawyers, people that are kind of maybe anti the industry as right, well. Right, sure. Yeah. I really hope those type of people show up, right? Yeah. But uh, they're going to basically have the capabilities to show them you know, in, in, the, in the flower world, we call it seed to sale. I guess in this world, we'll call it from production to sale. But they want to indicate all the safety and compliance that goes from creating the actual liquid and right. actually enhancing the liquid with all the different types of cannabinoids all the way through until it's actually in the can. And then the safety of the shipment that goes into, you know, sending it over to the consumers as well. Amazing, man. Well, it seems like things are going in a really interesting and positive direction, hopefully. Yeah, well, and listen, man, at the end of the day, this all could change next week. And that's exactly. kind of the, the craziness and the excitement of this industry. And what really keeps, you know, me personally on my toes is, you know, you never know what could happen tomorrow or what, yes, what yesterday's events could change you know, right. next week. Well, we'll keep on top of it. And uh, every time these new changes come along, we'll make sure to have more of these conversations. And looking forward to the next one. Thanks again for your time, man. Yeah, no, thank you, Brad. And uh, thank you to the, to the CBD and hemp community out there. You know, I'll try to stay on top of the horse, keep learning, and keep, you know, trying to be a part of these updates. And we'll see, you know, where else these conversations go. Absolutely. All awesome. right, now we'll talk soon. Thank you. All right.